1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. This is the reading of God's word. This is going to be uh, uh, an exposition of probably uh, one of the most difficult passages in the New Testament, if not the most difficult. A very, very difficult passage to explain, to understand, and to apply. I want to uh, warn you that this is going to be a rather an academic uh, exercise for us as we look at this passage. I, uh, I have this side thing that I do for Korean-speaking pastors, in which I coach uh, Christ-centered preaching, and uh, I always explain to them by saying there's got to be three points, exposition, and uh, there has to be persuasion, and third, there's got to be proclamation. And uh, today, it's going to be more of exposition and explanation and uh, study of this text, and hopefully we can, we can see where uh, we can apply this passage in your life, especially as you discuss this in your community groups. And I want to encourage, especially the youth students who are here, welcome. I'm, I'm glad you're here and uh, we can study this together. Younger people and the visitors and, and, and guests, welcome to our church. Uh, three things I want to go right into this passage and three things I'm going to talk about is the redemption of the conqueror, the proclamation of the conqueror, and the triumph, triumph of the conqueror. The title of the passage is The Righteous Conqueror. And You've probably guessed already, if you've been coming to our church for several years, that the songs that we sing and, and the songs that our praise leaders select are very in tune and very consistent with the uh, given passage of that Sunday. And you've noticed the songs we, we, we sang about uh, what we believe and how Christ is uh, the victor, and how we have the triumph, and we continue to celebrate and meditate on that, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And we can see that, uh, that the first century Christians needed to hear this because they went through a tremendous amount of suffering and even persecution for the sake of following Jesus. As I said last Sunday, if you're here, and if you're not, if you weren't here uh, last Sunday, that's, that's fine. I'm giving you a little summary. From verses 13 to 18, it explains uh, those people who suffer for the sake of Christ is blessed. Because they're not suffering alone. They're not going through difficulties and challenges of life alone. Not only that they have community around them, but they have their Lord Jesus Christ, who went ahead and experienced suffering, and who suffered for them to the point of death. And that's what uh, our previous uh, text uh, taught us. We may suffer, we may even die for the sake of Jesus, but Jesus, the righteous one, has already walked the road marked with righteous suffering, and he faced death. And our willingness to suffer for the sake of Christ is grounded in the wonder of Christ's willingness to suffer and die in our place. That's sort of like a conclusion of my sermon last Sunday, that 
the reason why we're able to go through the hardships and suffering in life is to say, this is what Jesus went through to give us eternal peace and happiness and joy. We can certainly follow him in this world. And now, Peter presents the suffering Christ as the victor. He's talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's talking about the ascension of Jesus Christ. In the previous passage, Apostle Peter talks about the meekness and humiliation and suffering of Jesus, and now he's talking about the victory, resurrection, and power of Jesus. In this passage, this is a summary of the entire sermon, okay? This is a summary. This is my summary statement of the entire sermon. If you get this, you get the whole sermon. Peter tells us that Christ, who suffered and died, was made alive again. He's gone to heaven and is at the right hand of God. He's the conqueror and we share in his triumph. Christians who follow Jesus share in the triumph of Jesus Christ. And that's the main point. And this is how one of the theologians, Ed Clowney, phrased it. Edmund P. Clowney, uh, one of the most uh, respected uh, professors who, uh, he was the second president of Westminster Seminary, where my alma mater, and uh, Edmund P. Clowney, this is where I had my youngest son, Prosper, name after this gentleman. Uh, his name is Edmund Prosper Clowney. And uh, there was one time I met him in the hallway of Westminster Seminary, and I said, hey, Dr. Clowney, uh, I asked him, uh, do you know my, what my son's name is? I was just like trying to strike a conversation. He says, no, I mean, obviously, I don't, I don't know your son's name. And then I said, his name is Prosper, named after you. And uh, he was pretty thrilled, and he says, does he like it? And I said, I, said, uh, I think so. And then he goes, I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> and I still don't like it. Prosper, clowny. But uh, anyway, this is what he says. Persecuted and suffering Christians need to remember both the humiliation and the exaltation of Christ. His patient suffering will show them meekness when they are interrogated. His glorious triumph will give them courage to face their accusers. Undergirding both the meekness and the boldness of the Christian is the saving work of Christ. So we have to have this both and attention at the same time. The meekness of Christ, the suffering of Jesus, the humiliation of Jesus. Yes, we think about the cross of Christ and we say, yes, Jesus died. Yes, Jesus suffered. Yes, he went through meekness and he was humble. Thus, we ought to be humble. Thus, we can experience suffering. Thus, we can endure persecution in this world. Yes, but at the same time, simultaneously, he was exalted. He was risen. He ascended. He conquered death. So his exaltation is as much as ours as his humiliation. So we can be Humble and bold at the same time. It's not like some days we're humble, some days we're bold, but humble and bold at the same time. That's what Clown is saying here. Undergirding the both, both the meekness and the boldness of the Christian is the saving work of Christ. It's not Christians who are always going like, oh, I don't know, I can't do anything, I'm trying to be humble. No. And it's not always Christians going around and saying, yeah, we have victory, victory. No. It's humility and boldness at the same time. And that's the gospel message. And that's what, trying, that's what Peter is trying to say. That's the foundation. And now, here's a proclamation of the conqueror, verses 19 to 20. It's in this context of Jesus 
being our triumphant king. And, and in this passage, Peter is emphasizing the triumphant exaltation part, the boldness part. He's not saying, at one point you emphasize humiliation, you say humiliation, and the other point, no. He's just emphasizing. He's saying the both, but now he's emphasizing this in these verses. That's why we have to read these letters in its context. And we have to understand this in its context. Verse 19, this is what he says. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Christ went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Do you even know what that means? If I were to ask you, Christ went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, how do you understand that? What does that mean? This verse is a troublemaker. What, how do we understand it? I bet the first century hearers, when they heard this, they said, okay, yes. But now, after so many years, thousands of years, we read this passage and we're like, we're not like first century Christians. We've lost context. We don't understand, so we are baffled. How do we even understand this? The issues are, there are three issues, three questions that we have to ask. Who are the spirits in prison? Unbelievers who died? Old Testament believers who've died? Fallen angels? Is that what he's talking about? Spirits in prison? Second question is, what did Christ preach? What did he actually preach? Second chance of repentance? Or did he proclaim the complete work of his redemption? It's finished. I'm going to say it again. It's finished. Is that what he said? Or is it final condemnation? You are all doomed to hell forever and you're going to stay here. What did Christ preach? Third, when did he preach this? In the days of Noah? Because if you read verse 20 and following, you can see in the days of Noah, Christ preached, it says. Did Christ come in the days of Noah? As Noah was building the ark, he preached? Or is it between his death and resurrection? When he died, he went down somewhere? He went somewhere, of course, the Bible doesn't say down, but he, did he go somewhere and preach between his death and resurrection? Or is it his, after his resurrection, he rose from the dead and he went and preached to spirits in prison? So these are three questions that we have to answer to understand this text so that we can apply it properly. If you don't understand this text, we're going to apply it differently, and we're going to make what, say whatever we want to say. So who are the spirits in prison? What did Christ preach? When did he preach? Various answers, of course. There are theologian scholars who, who, who get uh, multiple PhD degrees on exegeting this simple verse. Multiple and various, various interpretations, but I'll go over just five common views. It's important for us to understand what this means so that we can apply it. Five common. It may come across as oversimplification. I want it to be academic enough for us to really be thoughtful in this passage, but I don't want it to be too academic where we lose the meaning and uh, we just, you know, feel like this is in a classroom. A very general, maybe oversimplified explanation, but here we go. And this is what I've gathered reading from different commentaries and uh, mainly from this gentleman, Wayne Grudem. Uh, in his first introduction, uh, introduction to the first Peter commentary. There are five views. This is view number one. 
when Noah was building the ark, we, we, do you know the context here? We read this already. Let's, can we, uh, Elliot, let's take us, to, take us back to verse uh, 20 and 21. There's my, there's my assistant. He's so good. Look at that. He's so quick. All right. That's my main boy right there. All right. Look at, look at what it says in verse 20. These were the spirits of those who had not obeyed God when he waited patiently during the days that Noah was building his boat. The few people in the boat, eight in all, were saved by the water, which was a symbol pointing to baptism, which now saves you. Now take us back to view number one. When Noah was building the ark, Christ, in spirit, was in Noah preaching repentance and righteousness to the unbelievers who were on the earth then, but now spirits in prison, namely hell. That's view one, number one, that Jesus, in spirit, preached through Noah. That's how we can interpret verse 20, view number one. View number two. After Christ died, he went and preached to people in hell, offering them the second chance of salvation. So basically, Jesus died and went to hell and preached to those people who were in hell. And some people misread the Apostles' Creed. When we, we, we will confess later. It says, he was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into Hades. That's how we translate, that's how I translate it. But some people say he descended into hell. And thinking that is the literal hell that Jesus went down to. That's view number two. That Jesus went to hell, offering them second chance of salvation. View number three. After Christ died, he went and preached to people in hell, proclaiming to them that he had triumphed over them, and their final condemnation is given, that they're going to suffer there forever. So, view number two is he went down to hell and gave them second chance sermon, sermon about second chance. View number three says, he died, he went down to hell and just proclaimed, you're going to suffer here forever. That's the difference between view number two and view number three. View number four. After Christ died, he proclaimed release to people who had repented just before they died in the flood and led them out of their imprisonment in purgatory into heaven. This is more in line with the doctrine of Catholicism. View number five, after Christ died, or after he rose, before he ascended into heaven, he traveled or went to hell and proclaimed triumph over the fallen agents, angels who sinned by marrying human women before the flood. Where do we get this from? In Genesis 6, we can see that there's Nephilims and angels marrying, and there was a spiritual, and that's one of the tough passages to interpret in in, in the Old Testament. So a lot of people, people who hold on to view number 5, will go back to Genesis 6 and then take that literally and explain this in this fashion. Is there any way for us to show all five views in one slide? We don't have that, right? Oh, that's fine. That's good. This is wonderful. Uh, If you can remember all the views, I I wonder which view sounds most consistent to you. Those of you who say view number one, uh, stand up. And wave. Uh, Those of you who say view number two, uh, stand on this side. 
So let's, let's do this exercise. View number one on this corner, have exercise. View number two over there, view number three, view number four, view number five. No, we're not going to do that, right? No, we're not, we're not, we're not going to do that. I, I see your look in your face, like you, you can't be real. No, I wasn't serious at all. What view do I take? I'm not going to force on you. I'm just going to share what I think is most consistent throughout the scripture. I think view number one is the most consistent one that we can see throughout the scripture here. And, and that's the view that Wayne Grudem proposes and also my old professor Ed Clowney supports. And I'm convinced of this. This is what Wayne, Wayne Grudem says, that the translation is difficult. But uh, he says we should read it this way. He went and preached to those who are now spirits in prison who formerly disobeyed. Who formerly disobeyed. This is the most consistent in our orthodox Christian view. In the most orthodox Christian view, view number one is most accepted view here. Jesus went and preached to people while they were disobedient, not after. In other words, he went and he preached and they were disobedient. And now, therefore, they're in the spirits in prison. Uh, the question is, how could Jesus have done that? How could Jesus have done that? I mean, do we, do we know that Jesus actually was in pre-incarnate state? How can we say that Jesus went and preached in the days of Noah? Is this, is this getting too complicated, academic? This is, this is serious, uh, seriously good question that we have to, we have to ponder. And, and my answer is simple. It's very easy. It's not as difficult as it sounds. There's a passage in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17, where Apostle Paul talks about the people in Ephesus, and he says, Christ came and preached to you. He says, Christ came and preached to you. But we know that Jesus never went to the city of Ephesus in his lifetime. In the life of Jesus, he never went to Ephesus and preached in person. Then what does Paul mean here? What Paul is saying is Christ preaches through the people who preach. So as if he was there... His spirit, through his apostles, through his preachers, he preached. So if we take that logic in, the old, in, in, in this passage of Noah, that Christ preached through Noah. In fact, 2 Peter 2.5 mentions Noah as a herald of, of righteousness, or in other words, preacher of righteousness in 2 Peter 2.5. He was a preacher of righteousness, and there is a connection of Christ being and speaking through Noah. Very consistent. What does all of this mean? Apostle Peter mentions this because he wants to bring up Noah. You see? He, he had a, a, a mind, he had, a, he had a t intention in writing all this. I don't know if you remember, but uh, mm, like one of the first sermons I preached from 1 Peter, I said uh, reading 1 Peter is very, very difficult because he was not academically trained. Unlike Paul, who was very logical, and it was easy to understand because it's, academic sort of writing, but Peter was 
probably uneducated fisherman who wrote stuff, and he wasn't as logical. So it's so hard to understand First Peter because he's like all over. He's all over. He's sort of like me when I talk, all over. So I kind of get Peter. Because he, he, he wanted to say something, so he has to bring it up, and then he's in his mind, this, that's being logical. But for most of you, it's like, huh? But I get him. He, he's bringing all this up because he wants to talk about Noah. And he's bringing up Noah because he wants to talk about ultimately baptism. And that's his point here. That's the point, baptism. According to Peter, Noah's family was brought safely through water, verse 20. He continues in verse 20. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven, verse 21 and 22. If we streamline this, we hear the words, baptism now saves you. That's what it sounds like. Baptism now saves you. And churches have for a long time debated over this. Baptism saves you? It feels like that's what it's saying. In the early church, many thought baptism to be essential for salvation. Some supported the doctrine that infants were incorporated into the faith and life of the church by the baptism. Others, however, focused on the long preparation of adult converts for baptism. So, in our contemporary language, we have Infant baptism versus believer's baptism discussion. Do we baptize babies or do we wait a long time until they're able to confess? They linked baptism and the confession of faith and talked about how it's got to be consistent with what you believe, not just giving baptism to babies. So here are the questions about the issue. There are still questions and debates whether baptism is rightly applied to children. And if so, what it signifies and what it accomplishes. And I go over this when I teach Intro to LFCC Seminar. If you're interested, you can come to the next seminar, and I do extensive teaching on this. And if you're interested, even if you're a member, you forgot, you can come to that section and discuss more. But I'll I'll give you briefly here. Once again, I might be oversimplifying this. But I just want to say that we should avoid two errors. There are two errors we have to avoid when we think about baptism. There are people who do not want to reduce baptism to a mere symbol of grace already received. It it can't be just mere symbol. It's not just a symbolic memorial thing we go through every time we observe sacraments. Now, Protestants. Protestants believe in two sacraments, whereas Roman Catholics have seven sacraments. Protestants have two sacraments. You, do you know what two, those two sacraments are for, for the Protestants? Two sacraments? Baptism and water that saves. Peter brings up Noah because he wants to talk about baptism And he talks about baptism because through baptism you can have clear conscience or assurance of salvation. And through baptism you can be sure that you belong to God. And what does baptism actually accomplish? Not salvation, but 
it brings a person into the covenant community. That's what it actually accomplishes. Through baptism, you're going into the church as a member of that community in baptism. That's why we bring in infants and children into the covenant community. We don't want the children to be spiritually orphans where they have no covenant community. Only adults get to get be in covenant community? No, children. That's why we baptize babies in our church. And that's why in big majority of the church baptize babies. There's another majority that doesn't. And we're not going to argue over that. There are extremes who say, this side is sinning, that side is sinning. I go like, you're sinning by condemning and judging people. But there are two extreme views. But here, in our church as a Presbyterian, we believe that baptism, what does it accomplish? It brings a person into a covenant community. What does it mean? It's a sign and seal that we are united to Christ in his death and resurrection. And that leads to my final point, verse 21 to 22. I got to finish this. Uh, I have to uh, finish this quick. Verse 21 and 22, baptism is important because it's, it's a reenactment of your union with Jesus Christ. Through baptism, you're saying that Jesus' death is your death and his resurrection is your resurrection. As Noah fled into the ark, so we flee to Christ, and in him we escape judgment. Because Noah's ark is a type of Christ. As people fled into Noah's ark, we're saved, we flee to Christ, and we are saved. So Christians can have clear conscience, assurance of salvation. And here's what we're taught about the resurrection. God does not raise Jesus from the dead and say, here, I rose Jesus from the dead so that you can follow and you can just learn great lessons from him. I want you to take him as a good teacher. I rose him from the dead. I, I, I gave him new life. He was actually dead, but now he's risen. Okay? So whatever he teaches you, you listen to him. That's not the purpose. The resurrection says, this is your Savior. He died on the cross. He changed everything. He accomplished greatest thing in the world. It gives you new life, new beginning, new eternal, physical restoration, and new beginning. If the resurrection doesn't have to happen, Jesus' death is meaningless, and I say this often. The cross of Jesus is meaningless without the resurrection of Christ. Jesus' death is silly. It's silly. You'll be like, oh yeah, Jesus died, I'm so sad. I'm not going to give my life to a person who just died. I'm not going to pray, pray, pray with tears, literally praying for my children and my loved ones that they be saved that they can have eternal life if Jesus didn't rise from the dead if he just died we'll just teach them how to be sympathetic Jesus' death makes no sense Jesus' death accomplishes nothing without the resurrection it's the reality of resurrection that we are able to endure suffering now. It's the reality of resurrection 
that things don't make sense now. I even had the audacity, and I almost said blasphemous statement here, right here in this stage, God, you better be sovereign. Because a lot of things don't make sense in this world. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, I can't put up with stuff going on. And Peter completes this discussion with the mention of Christ's ascension into heaven. He didn't just rise, but he ascended to heaven. Jesus has gone into heaven and now is at the right hand of God. This is very, very weird for modern thinkers. And we, are, we hesitate so much to talk about Jesus in heaven in literal spatial term. And I've given a lot of thought about this. And then Candace and I and, and other theologian friends, we discussed a lot about this Jesus being ascended to heaven now, and we are united with him. What does that mean? We're united with him in his death. Yes, we're united with him in his resurrection. And yes, we're united with him in his ascension. Jesus did not just ascend spiritually. How did he ascend? Physically. And we're with him. This is crazy. I want to leave you with this crazy thought and get you all perplexed. That was the intention of my sermon today, to get you all perplexed. Read with me to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to 6. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. All past tense. Raised and seated. Our union with Christ doesn't stop here. Our union with Christ continues in the heavenly realms. You are seated with him. You're raised and seated with him. Though we're living in this fallen 